Welcome to the Sustainable Production Forum. Hath squile, each tenoya, toits tenat quien quenchamen, cease quien sna, on hath in squalowin, on wanoxed in squalowin teat seeds. Welcome everybody. It lifts my heart to welcome you to these ancestral lands and waters of the Huamathquiam, the Tesleweth and the Skolmish Oath Olkameo. I am Skolmish and Stalo, and I'm standing on these shorelines where the salt water meets the shoreline and and comes back into the forest with ancient trees, ancient cedar trees, ancient fir trees, and ancient maples. Welcome, OCM. job at CBC Radio Canada to report on what we as Canadians care about. Politics, culture, sports, entertainment. But there's a bigger picture. Something Canadians care about even more, the environment. It's what all the rest of it hinges on. We wouldn't be here without forests, wildlife, and oceans. Stories on the environment often have a way of making us feel powerless and small. Who are we against a hurricane? Who are we against a wildfire? Who are we against a changing climate? We are more powerful than it seems. So we're not just going to report on the environment. We're going to take action and help preserve all the things we care about. We've looked at how we can do better and set some goals for 2026. And that's just the beginning. Our ultimate goal is carbon neutral. As we move towards zero, we will report on our progress. Keeping you informed is our job, after all. Ontario's film and television industry is committed to a sustainable future. The Ontario Green Screen Initiative is a public-private partnership of industry leaders that have assembled to provide the tools, relationships, resources, and educational opportunities required to make real environmental change. Visit OntarioGreenScreen.ca for more information about how you can take part. Welcome to SPF 22. I'm Zena Harris, President of GreenSpark Group and Creative Director of the Sustainable Production Forum. Hi, I'm Melanie Wendell, Executive Producer of the Sustainable Production Forum. Thank you for being here with us. I'd like to thank Cease Weiss for that wonderful traditional welcome. I'm tuning in from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, and Pakani, the Sutna Nation, the Nakoda Nations, the Metis Nation Region 3, in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. 
Today, I'm tuning in from the traditional territories of the Puyallup and Coast Salish peoples of the Puget Sound area. This virtual event is coming to you from around the globe. And if you are unsure of whose traditional land you are watching us from, you can visit native-land.ca or indigenousworld.org to learn more. Those links should be popping up in the chat shortly. Please share with us in the chat where you are tuning in from. We are so excited to welcome you back to the seventh annual Sustainable Production Forum. It's a delight to gather again. For the better part of 2022, Zina and I have been discussing your pain points, your successes, and figuring out how we can have an impact and move the needle in decarbonization in our sector. We have been meeting with leaders, experts, change makers, and disruptors for the last six weeks, having incredible conversations and we are excited to share them with you throughout the month of October. If you have occasion to be in Vancouver, Toronto, or New York City, don't forget to check out our in-person events. Please introduce yourself. We love seeing the community grow. Something special about SPF is that it is a gathering place for stakeholders across the entertainment industry. And we are very grateful for the support, collaboration, and allyship we have developed with our partners. The SPF 22 lead partners are presenting partner, Real Green, Creative BC, Motion Picture Production Industry Association, Platinum Partner, MBS Canada, Signature Partners, CBC Radio Canada and Telefilm Canada. Please visit our website or check out our sponsor page on the event platform to get to know all our partners and vendors. A bit of housekeeping please take an opportunity to engage with the community board to post or take our polls during sessions. Say hello to our partners and vendors. Please help us gather important measuring points by participating. Join the social media conversation by using the hashtag SPF22. Hello, and welcome to In Conversation with Scott Z. Burns, presented by Signature Partner, Telefilm Canada. Shining a light on the climate story on both sides of the lens is a priority for Scott Z. Burns. In this lively fireside, we'll take a deeper dive in how Scott approaches sustainable production practice, as well as climate storytelling at the core. Joining us are, of course, Scott Z. Burns, executive producer, showrunner, Extrapolations, Scott Z. Burns is a screenwriter, director, producer, and playwright. Burns's work in film includes producing the Academy Award-winning documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, as well as An Inconvenient Sequel and Sea of Shadows. Burns is the creator and executive producer of a forthcoming anthology series about the ramifications of climate change and the future of humanity, Extrapolations, for Apple TV+. And leading this conversation is Zena Harris, President GreenSpark Group, Creative Director at the Sustainable Production Forum. She is the bold visionary behind GreenSpark Group. Zena has worked with studios such as 21st Century Fox, NBC Universal, and Amazon to implement sustainable production practices on film and television. Zena holds a master's degree from Harvard University in sustainability and environmental management. Welcome to you both. Well, hi, Scott. Hi, it's nice to see you. To see you too. <laughs> I know it's been a little while. I know we worked together um, last year, but um, I'm excited to have you here at SPF 22 and to chat with you a little bit, um, get to know you a little bit better and hear about, um, you know, how you've been thinking of climate change and storytelling over the years. Um, so let's dive into that as a, as a first piece. Like, Tell us a little bit more about your sustainability story. Where, you know, how did this come to be? How did you start thinking about climate change and storytelling? Wow, that's sort of been a lifelong thing. I mean, I, it's funny that I woke up this morning to the news that there's a new study on species loss, um, which sort of made this particularly poignant for me to, to come and talk to you. You know, I think my, first real attachment to any of this was when I was a little kid growing up in Minnesota and I, I got involved. My school project was 
um, a save the humpback whales thing. And it's never been out of my mind. You know, I, I had the good fortune to grow up um, spending my summers in the woods in Northern Minnesota. Um, I had the good fortune to grow up in a place that had seasons and had fish in the lakes and things like that. And it, it just always stayed with me. And I, I got a little older and, you know, always had it be a part of my life. I, I had an incredible opportunity where I met Dennis Hayes, who is one of the founders and, and, you know, kind of runs Earth Day. But this was back in the 90s. And I told Dennis that I wanted to quit and just come work for him. Um, and he's like, no, we actually need you to stay where you are um, because we need people to create change where they are um, in the businesses that, that they're in. And that really stuck with me. And I found myself eventually um, at a presentation by Al Gore um, and Lori David, who I'd worked with at the NRDC here in LA um, and Lauren Spender approached um, Gore and said, can we turn your, your presentation into a, you know, a doc? And that became an inconvenient truth. Um, and after that, I felt, you know, that my obligation to Al and to everybody who was involved in that film, and, and more importantly, it sort of became inescapable. You can't come to recognize climate change, I feel, and then go back to not knowing. Um, I think once you know, you, you have an obligation to act. And a few years after that, I was invited to a conference in Italy um, where I came up with the idea of could, instead of this always being a documentary, because I, I feel like we've, we've reached the people who, who watch documentaries. Mm -hmm. um, could, we, could we somehow invade scripted entertainment? Um, and I read this brilliant essay by an Indian writer named Amitav Ghosh called The Great Derangement, um, where he talks <clears throat> about, you know, artists at other times um, helped us understand the world that we lived in with their work, certainly in World War II. You know, we came to understand a great deal about that war and the Holocaust through film and through, you know, through some of the great novels of the middle of the 20th century. Um, and I felt like this, this is the story of this time. Um, and as a storyteller, I need to make sure that it's part of my life, but also part of my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, it's, it's like the kernel of all of this is so true for all of us. I think, you know, we start, you know, there's something sparks within us, uh, you know, the seed is planted when we're, we're very young and it just kind of, you know, weaves its way throughout in, in what we do. And it's such a great point about creating the change where you are. Um, because I think, you know, we're reaching a lot of people with this kind of conversation and that just makes, makes such sense. You don't have to go into a sustainability career, but you can, you can make the change where you are. Did you know early on when you were, you know, having those conversations um, with Al and others about turning his presentation into uh, a documentary, did you know it was going to have the sort of societal impact it did, um, you know, going into that? Uh, no, uh, you know, my, my answer to that is, is maybe surprising to you and to other people. You know, when you're on the inside of something, it's hard to measure, you know, the impact. Um, and it was, it was wonderful to have the work received and it was wonderful to help Al reveal a little more of himself to the world. Cause, you know, to go back in a time machine to 2005, 2006, Al pretty much vanished after the 2000 election. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what Davis Guggenheim, who directed that movie and I would talk about creatively is we're also bringing this person, you know, back into public life. Mm -hmm. And Al does his climate work with a great deal of integrity 
Um, he researches stuff. He he really goes deep, and and so you know for for me there there isn't really a societal experience of that film. There's just a deeply personal one with the people who I made it with. Um, mm -hmm. I find that to to be true on on most projects. Um, I, I don't understand. You know, I don't understand a, a public life. You know, I mean, you go to a premiere and there's people on on either side of you know a, a step and repeat line, but I know that two blocks away there are you know homeless people and there are people who don't really care or aren't thinking about climate, and so I don't know what an impact is. I will tell you that. You know, Davis Guggenheim and I still get together a few times a year, and this may come as a shock, but but we don't. We're stunned that we didn't make more of a difference. We're stunned that to tell that story, and still have people either pushing back against it. Although thankfully, there's less of that now. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you kind of see it everywhere. And, and I think that's what Dennis Hayes was trying to tell me is that, you know, like anything systemic, you know, be it patriarchal, be it racial, any of these big systemic problems, once you become aware of it, it's, it's in everything, you know, and you have to go back and really reevaluate all sorts of choices about, you know, about the temperature of the room you're in and the car you drive and all and the people you vote for and how much new clothing do you buy and where does it come like all of these things every aspect of our lives needs to to undergo a kind of inspection that I think is really healthy yeah yeah I agree I agree <laughs> um well I'll just say uh an inconvenient truth for me was a big moment. I mean, so I just, you know, personally, you know, thank you for bringing that forward. Um, I noticed just so much more awareness around me. Um, you know, I was already kind of into the the subject matter anyway, and then you know, bringing something like that out into the mainstream was like just fantastic. So yeah, um, I, yeah. I mean, I still am, you know. Lawrence Bender and I will talk about it. And, and when people ask me, you know, what's what's your favorite thing you've ever done? I think, you know, I'll, I loved writing the informant and telling that story and making people laugh. But, you know, an inconvenient truth wasn't, wasn't any, you know, it was an act of, of passion and personal obligation and really spiritual for us. And I know that sounds sort of bullshit, but, it really was. It's very much a part of, you know, the decisions I make in my home. Um, and I'm not perfect. And I make mistakes constantly out of laziness, out of, you know, being in a hurry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, Bill McKibben, you know, is famous for saying that, you know, if you're going to be in this, you know, you got to recognize that we're all going to be hypocrites. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it, it's multifaceted in that, you know, our society is set up in a certain way, it's really hard to get it right all the time, and and we just, we kind of never really will, there's a whole lot of layers, you know, going on, um, and, and I think that's one of the things that, that folks tend to jump to is sustainability is that, you know, it's got to be perfect to do to do anything or we've got to you know give up everything to to make a difference or or whatever the case is do you find that when you're kind of talking through these you know climate um storylines and whatnot with folks do you find that sentiment come out as well i think it's become you know it's always been a, a way to skewer people who who you know care about what you and i care about or who work in 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 my industry who care about climate and then you know you you skewer them for you know their their clothing or their travel or any of these things and and suddenly they become you know hypocrites and they're dismissed 
And, and we can't let that happen. You know, I think sometimes there aren't great alternatives, you know, as, as you know, on our show, you know, that I just finished for Apple, we, you know, we sometimes needed amazing actors to come and some of them live in Europe and we wanted the show to be international. And there isn't right now a great airplane that exists that has, you know, that has no emissions. And so do you, you know, what do you do? You know, well, yeah, I can talk to the actors and to the platform and our financiers about zeroing out carbon. Um, but you and I both know that we don't really have a great price for carbon right now. And that we're fooling ourselves if we think that you can carbon, you know, that you can do some sort of carbon offset and it's all going to be okay. We don't have the time for that. And we're not, we're not anywhere near the right price for what carbon is. Mm -hmm. And so giving people permission to, to burn more carbon and think that you can offset your way out of it is very scary to me. Um, it also has so much sort of built in economic injustice that it makes me really uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. It is, uh, it's, it's one of those uh, topics where it's a good escape for, for a lot of people and um, a good opportunity to get it done and not think about what the repercussions might be or, um, and I think that, you know, not only talking about it in, in, in the narrative uh, in, in the storytelling, but also, you know, demonstrating opportunities to reduce emissions behind the camera. I mean, the two work sort of hand in hand in that regard in a, in a you know, holistic way for, for a project. Um, I mean, just as, just kind of, you know, thinking through um, the, the work that you've done, I mean, how has this climate narrative changed for you, evolved for you over the years? What pieces have you clung to and what were you like, I'm not touching that anymore? Um, a lot. <laughs> it's changed <laughs> a lot. I mean, it definitely informs, you know, um, decisions about some projects that I'll take on and, and some that I won't. And when I have the honor of being a showrunner or director and having some amount of control over what goes on on a set, um, it's a huge part of the decisions that I make. And, and, you know, again, like I think, you know, the goal for me within my industry is to look at it and go, okay, so what are the choices we have right now to accomplish what needs to be done? We have to shoot an episode of something what are the choices that really exist um, for us? Okay, can we, you know, can we make a better decision than we used to? And if we can't, can we at least try and raise consciousness and help pave a way? You know, I mean, I'll, I'll give a, a little example um, where there's a, a show that I'm working on and it's gonna shoot in, in Budapest. Okay, now there are a lot of reasons why it's going to shoot in Budapest. Um, it turns out things are cheaper there and a lot of these streamers shoot their shows in Eastern Europe. Um, and am I cool with that? No, I don't know that you should take jobs away from people and go and, and to a, an environment where people don't get the right wage. And it becomes this very complicated thing, but we had a conversation recently about, um, about the war in Ukraine and what that's gonna do to the energy supply as we go into production. And it's going to drive our costs up. We don't even know how much. So we're having this big hand wringing meeting and I was like, maybe this is a moment that we buy some solar powered jennies. You know, what if this is the moment that we can begin to inoculate ourselves against an uncertain energy environment, but also, you know, begin to clean up our act. And so I think it's, you know, for me, it's now looking at these things going, 
you know, are there opportunities in these problems? Um, and also, are there problems in these opportunities? I know I've had this conversation with you before, I think, but like, you know, when we shot extrapolations in New York, I had hoped we would be able to use a lot of really beautiful architecture. And unfortunately, because of COVID, a lot of these places didn't want us in the buildings. Um, they were just shut down and opening up at all would have been expensive. And so we had to build more sets. Okay, well, that became, you know, a big issue for cost because supply chain changed and suddenly construction materials were more expensive. And so it makes the argument of recycled lumber and, you know, other things harder to win with, with your streamer and your financier. And, and then you find yourself on a scout and it's winter and you have Teamsters because you have to have Teamsters and that's part of working in New York. But the Teamsters, you know, keep the van warm for you. And so you go in to look at a location because you desperately need it because you can't build because you've run out of money and the van just sits there running and you want to tell people to turn off the van but their attitude is I'm not gonna sit here and freeze or, you know. So it, it becomes a very complicated thing. And at the end of the day, for me, it's just having more consciousness around it is the start. And I know that also sounds sort of weak, but without it, you'll never get to a place where you start questioning the decisions. And, you know, going to the Teamsters and saying, is there a way for us to have fewer vans? Can we put more people in the vans? Can I self-drive, you know, and, and take an electric vehicle? Can we find an electric van? Um, and so you can start changing the dialogue around the problem. And, you know, and a lot of these things sound small, um, but they add up, as you well know. Um, and and the bigger things, you know, those require changes in leadership in our, in our governments. Um, and, and sometimes the best way to do that is to demonstrate to people that I'll still do my job. I'll still bring this in under budget. Um, so that's the behind the camera thing. And think in terms of the storytelling part of it, it's in who I am. And so you know, any story that I write, I think is going to reflect, you know, the values that, that I embrace. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. Dorothy Fortenberry, who, you know, worked with me on extrapolations, you know, would always say, the shows that pretend that the climate is going to be the same in the future, those are the science fiction shows. Yeah. The show is not. And so before you park us over there in science fiction land, you know, realize that our assumptions about the future and about the climate are based on the best facts we could, we could find and talking to the smartest scientists um, and researchers we could, you know, involve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that, um, you know, you started, uh, you know, talking about um, asking questions, investigating, what can we do? Not, not only through, you know, also the storytelling, but also behind the camera, because that's a, that's a big piece um, in, in sort of the investigation of what's possible. Um, and when you do that, when you ask those questions, what, like, what, what are the typical responses you get? Are folks curious as well? Do they wanna go along on the ride with you and try to figure this out? Or like, I'm just, I'm curious, you know, from your perspective. You run into a little bit of everything, you know, there, you know, and again, it, it's, it's complicated for everyone. You know, the, my executives on extrapolations at Apple, you know, it's, it's, a, a corporation that has made a very public commitment to reaching carbon neutral, you know, ahead of the United States, ahead of China. Um, the woman who runs their sustainability program, you know, used to be the head of the EPA in America. Um, she came to our writer's room 
Um, she was incredibly persuasive with me that what you know their commitment was was real and not performative. And yet, do I think someone will someday say, "Oh, you did this for Apple, and you're greenwashing what they do?" Well, I don't know what to say anymore. You know, there is no perfect platform. Um, there is no, there is no, you know, way in the capitalist system in which we live for people to make things that aren't motivated by profit. And so this is, if you accept the rules of the game, then you got to start making the best, again, it goes back to what are the best decisions. And most of the executives that I worked with on the show, in fact, all of them would always say, you know, well, no, we want to do the right thing. We don't want to make a show about climate and then make it in a way that's disrespectful to the very DNA of the show. Mm -hmm. But then you have a budget conversation. And, you know, is it better to not make the show? Um, or do you have to just roll up your sleeves and, and try and work with people so that you can tell stories that you hope will reach people? And, you know, without having to make so many compromises that, you know, it becomes uncomfortable for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, part of that, you know, going back also, you know, we mentioned earlier, you know, it, perfection's not really the goal here. It's more iteration, you know, yeah. iteration, iteration over time. Um, so how, you know, with that, you know, thinking back to some of your previous work and then extrapolations and maybe what you're working on now, how has that how has your approach to maybe sustainable production um, evolved? You know, are you know the questions have the questions changed as you've you know gained uh, you know more experience with it or or had some great successes or even the challenges? Like how has that how has that evolved for you? Uh, quite a bit. You know, I think we're making progress, obviously, and and the work that, you know, GreenSpark and, and other people is, is having an impact. I think every streamer knows that they need to do better and their employee base wants them to do better. You know, when we have bigger teams kind of Zooms at, at Apple, you know, I'm always really gratified that the, the chat fills up with people saying that they're grateful to work on this show that it's something that's aligned with their life and who they are. And so it's great that that's actually a conversation that goes on or that people feel that's an okay thing to ask of a job. That's already a huge shift from, you know, where we were with an inconvenient truth. Um, I think the people who would go, oh, well, these things are just science lectures and nobody cares, I think, um, I think that's a less comfortable argument for people to make now. And, but it's one that I carry really closely. And Dorothy and I would say this all the time. We have to be entertaining. We're a TV show. Um, we go, we're in the same sort of, you know, world as, as, you know, Game of Thrones and House of Dragons and Ted Lasso and, you know, and all of these things that, that people watch we've got to be as entertaining and as compelling and funny and emotional and scary and all the things, all mm -hmm. the things that make up art and drama. And, you know, we have to be all of them. We don't get a pass because we're, you know, trying to get people to think differently about, about climate. And so, but we got, we got our foot in the door. You know, mm -hmm. like I, I feel that, you know, that extrapolations is a show that's going to be entirely driven by what human beings are going to experience going forward on this planet is, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to sell that show, I think even five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we had interest from more than Apple. Yeah. So that is a really wonderful thing. Yeah, 
Yeah, and and reflecting what's happening now um, in the world and and showing what <laughs> what that future state might look like, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, drive some awareness home to, yeah. to some folks. Um, I mean, the biggest disappointment for me is the amount of times where we would have a conversation in the writer's room or I would be writing a script three years ago, you know, about, oh, battery tech. And are we headed towards some sort of extractive thing for these rare earths that's going to result in another round of sort of extractive imperialism or what if the nickel and cobalt are on the seafloor and to get them, we're going to do incredible injury to marine environments. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in the middle of shooting that episode, <laughs> um, a, a big story came out in like Wired about exactly that and about billionaires focusing on batteries. Um, and the amount of, I, I can't even tell you the number of times where, you know, we felt we were being predictive, you know, 15, 20 years in the future, and then the very thing would happen in the world today. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, that was a really, you know, kind of a weird story, but again, like it's, it's what happens when you open yourself up as a writer or an artist to anything, you become aware of all of, all of the issues um, that, that touch on it. And hopefully it makes you do better work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the other interesting thing, just to go back, I was trying to think of like stuff that I've seen change and a really great change that I witnessed was, you know, on, on extrapolations, you know, there's a big conversation, as you know, about like, what, what are we use for lunch? And what do you do during COVID for lunch? And first of all, we introduced a lot of people to vegan meals, who I don't think ever had them. Um, and that was cool to see. And also, you saw that you could buy compostable containers and compostable utensils and put them in the compostable bin and and everything was cool and it made me so happy to see you know PAs grips gaffers everybody sort of honoring the notion of you know of you know, I always hated cradle to grave when that was sort of the conversation. Those were the, the markers, the cradle to cradle nature of, you know, a food, yeah. you know, because it's work. And when there's 150 people at work and you, you, you have to feed them lunch, you know, are we not responsible for that experience, you know, and they don't have an option during COVID. They can't walk away and go, find something that suits them and eat it off a ceramic plate. We mm -hmm. have to, we have to feed them and we have to feed them and then deal with that. And so those are, are big and important things, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So true. So true. Um, I mean, you've, you've got this, you know, this crew and, uh, and it's, it's about, I think, you know, you hit it like integration, modifying the systems, um, the responsibility of it all, because, you know, they're there, they're working, they're working toward this, you know, great goal of putting the story, bringing the story to life and, and, um, you know, setting them up for success, setting the process up for success yeah. is, is really like, it's challenging, but it, it's, it's, different every time, but it's really, really important. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and it's some of it is, is so, you know, it's like when you work in, in film, you become very solution oriented, you know, oh, we can't, we can't go and shoot in, you know, this other country. How can we fake it? How do we, how can we cut around it? What movie magic can we use? So that someone, you know, goes out a door in New York and then they're entering a door, you know, halfway around the world without going halfway around the world. And, you know, so those 
kinds of things are, are really, really, really important to, to think about in terms of how do I build these shots? How do I, you know, how do I, how do I solve these problems? And, you know, at the beginning of a lot of shoots now, people give out water bottles with the show's logo on it. And first of all, as you know, not all water bottles are created equal. Um, <laughs> But giving someone a reusable water bottle and then not giving them access to hydration stations where they can refill their water bottle isn't really solving the problem. Right. And people who work, whether it's a prop person, anybody who works on set, knows that their value is about their focus. And I was like, can we have a PA go around and refill water bottles for people so you know so that they don't feel disrupted so again like if you're going to solve the problem really think about the work experience of the person you know that you're involving yourself with mm -hmm. not just go here's a water bottle with a logo right 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 no that's totally Totally true. I feel like I say this all the time too. Like, it, you know, we're, we're solving problems here. There's always going to be something and we have to figure out how to work with it and adapt and, and solve the problem. And, and great, you know, to, to dive in further, think through um, what and it really it, means down the road. <laughs> you know, and a few years ago, I had the, the great opportunity to work on a project with Doctors Without Borders. And they told me this horrifying but really important story about trying to do good in the world where there was a, a war in a West African country that will remain anonymous for right now. And they were able to get a bunch of Land Rovers in to help get people who were injured in this guerrilla war into hospitals in the city. Within two days, the, <clears throat> the bad guys had stolen all of the Range Rovers, and now we're using them to shoot people out of. And I remember them saying to me, like, don't, we learned, don't bring technology into a situation unless you really understand, you know, the ramifications of it. And I know that's a lot different from a water bottle, but as we go through this, we're gonna recognize more and more that the solution really needs to be thought through. It's sort of like the carbon offset. Well, if you think you solved the problem, but what you paid for you know, a ton of carbon isn't really the right cost, maybe you've made it worse by allowing people the illusion that they're being responsible. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. And so I know we're, um, you know, in thinking through, you know, what you're working on now and your, you know, the situation that, you know, you've got in front of you now um, with your, your new project in Budapest, um, you know, where do you think that, how do you think that's going to unfold um, from a sustainability perspective? And what do you, what do you, what do you hope for? And where do you think that, you know, you really got a problem solved for? Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's not, it's not my project's project I'm a producer on. So insofar as I have, you know, I'm one of 10 people, sure. um, you know, my thing is always, oh, can we look at solar power generators? Can we have a, a sustainability person on set? Have we thought about, you know, um, what can we do to, you know, to make the things we can control better, mm -hmm. you know? and transportation, just like the world, you know, where it is one of the largest contributors, if not the largest contributing sector, you know, that is something that we all need to work on to improve. Um, it's hard for people to self-drive, um, you know, sometimes, and there are insurance issues about, do you want your lead actor to self-drive? Would they even do that? Would they rather take the time in the back seat to memorize their lines? What is the culture of the movie business that someone needs a giant fucking SUV to pick them up at the airport? Well, we have alternatives. We have hybrids. We have so 
the transportation thing I think is low hanging fruit on some level that we need to really think about. Um, and then, you know, food and stuff are also really important. And this illusion that people have that, you know, oh, doing set construction in Eastern Europe is gonna be cheaper is, is short-sighted. And so, you know, you really want to try and get your line producer to go, is there a place where we can at least donate the woods that we're using and the walls that we're using and the clothes that we're making? Yeah. Um, can we find second lives outside of our show for those things? And so I am always the person pushing that. And then eventually there's a line producer who would prefer I just shut the fuck up. <laughs> so keep asking those questions. I think that's that's the key, right? Uh, keep it in yeah, front, again, in front it, of it's mind. Just, yeah, it's just consciousness and, you know, and I know again, and I'll say this forever, because you know, if you knew me better, you would know that I'm, I'm, you know, I don't think consciousness raising is enough. You need strategy and you need action. But we, you need to be aware of what's really going on before you can get to a strategy. And you know, I think <clears throat> this notion, you know, the one last thing I really want to attack in my industry is the notion that storytelling always needs to be hopeful. I don't, I have a very different relationship to hope. To me, hope is something that comes after there's a strategy with a solution. You can't just sit around and hope. Right. You know? right. Even the Buddhists would say that that's not right. You know, that isn't, non-attachment, what, what makes a difference is looking at a problem and going, oh shit, if we did this and this and this and this, we would be making a difference. Well, once you know that, I'm all about hope. I'm all about positivity. I'm all about believing that people can change and that they wanna do better. You know, that they sometimes just need an education and an understanding that there's a, a, a different approach. But you can't start from hope like it becomes paralysis to just sit there and think, oh, it's going to get better. Yeah. I don't think it, I don't think it does on its own. No, not, not, not uh, hope from a place of inaction, you know, and yes. just waiting and, and wondering. Yeah. Solutions based um, action oriented progress gives, inspires, gives people hope. Right. Yeah. So, and for me, when I wake up and read an article about you know, the amount of species loss like I did today, my reaction isn't to pull the covers up over my head and go back to bed. It's to get up and figure out like, what can I do? Mm -hmm. Is there a documentary? Is there a, a scripted thing? How do I integrate a story about, you know, this in like, what does this look like? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this belief that fear leads to paralysis I think is again, something maybe we need to interrogate a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, those are great uh, closing thoughts, Scott. I wanna, I wanna thank you for this conversation. Thank you for the work that you're doing and for all the questions that you're asking and, and for weaving climate change into the work that you do. Um, Thank you for, for chatting with me. Well, thank you. And thank you for all, all of your help on extrapolations coming on Apple Plus in the spring. <laughs> I know, we're gonna get there, we're gonna get there. Yeah, we're gonna get there, we are gonna get there. <laughs> so yeah, but thank you for all you did to, to help everybody involved in our show. Yeah, no, it's good. I love it, I love it, I love the challenge. And it's great to, to have folks like yourself who are invested in this as well. So. All right. Thank you. All right.